So this is week three. Um, my original plan this week was to get into uh, sequencing with sound, you know, sort of spatially sequencing sound with patterns and p-bind. Uh, and as I started to prepare this, I, I thought there was actually a lot to talk about in just pure unit generator signal generating land. So uh, the, the main focus today, we're going to stick with UGENs, and I think I'm going to extend the stereophonic segment of class to three weeks instead of two, just to get a really solid foundation in dealing with unit generators before we really branch out into four channel and eight channel sound. Um, so uh, uh, in particular today, I want to talk about uh, triggers, uh, trigger signals in Super Collider, uh, touch on envelopes a little bit, and just as a reminder, uh, tutorial four uh, is um, uh, covers envelopes, so that's something to watch just to, to in case I don't sort of cover it comprehensively here. And then also a little bit more on uh, randomness, not necessarily um, uh, signals like LF noise, which are random number generators, but uh, UGENs which receive a trigger input and, and generate some randomness. So uh, I'm just I've got some initial code here to get us started. Here's our server setup code where we set the number of output buses and the number of channels to record. And we can confirm that we're using the Motu as our output device. And I have a few sound files here. So I set the path to my, uh, I, I've already saved this as code.scd in a folder called um, week three, I think. No, that's not it. Um, over here, yeah, so I've got my code and my source file. So in here I've got, uh, I don't think we're going to do these pop files today, but I've got two recordings of um, you know, wetting your finger and rubbing, a, rubbing it around the rim of a wine glass and also striking the wine glass. I think we're just going to focus on these wine glass rubs today. Um, so let's load those in. Um, and let's quickly just cook up a a very simple uh, function here, which just plays it using play bus. Uh, these are all monophonic sound files. Um, I'm just using some simple, you know, maybe these aren't the most descriptive names, but this is wine glass rub one, wine glass rub two, wine glass strike. So we're going to just say, let's play wine glass rub one. And done action two. Got to uh, uh, put bus two sig <coughs> All right. So this is just a um, uh, simple recording of a wine glass. I, I we can see how long it is. Wine glass rub one dot duration. You know, just about half a minute or so. Thirty two. 0.21, etc. Um, so, <coughs> one one nice thing we can do is if we have a, a long recording of something sustained, something textural, we can create um, you know percussive versions of that by applying a little amplitude uh, envelope. So, what we'll do here is is declare another variable uh, called env, and we're going to say env equals the, the unit generator we use to generate envelopes is just simply called envgen. And control rate is usually fine. You can do audio rate, but control rate is usually acceptable. And envgen needs an instance of a class called env as its first argument. So we'll just open up the help documentation real quick. Um, let's also open the meters, <coughs> just make sure we're looking at everything here. And let's open, you can do uh, apple option t to bring up the node tree so we can see what's living on the server. Right now we've just got, just got the, the level meters. Um, so envgen, uh, its first argument is envelope. And this is an instance of a class called env, which seems maybe at first a little redundant that we're putting an envelope inside of an envelope. But um, env is a, a language side object. It's sort of a, an abstract specification for a segmented function and with points, times between the points, and curvatures of the segments. And then envgen uses that specification to generate a signal. So um, well let's just uh, keep this, let's st step out of this for a second, and say uh, env.new, 
And env.new is the simplest and most flexible way to make an envelope. Uh, it needs an array containing uh, levels, an array containing durations, and an array containing curvature values. Uh, so for, let's just do a simple version here and say let's start at zero. <coughs> we'll go to one and we'll go to zero. We'll take a tenth of a second to go from zero to one. Uh, uh, four tenths, two fifths of a second, point four seconds to go back to zero. Uh, so note we've got three levels here and then two of these, right? Two of these uh, duration values because there's two segments but three points. And then these are curvature values. We'll start these at zero. And env is not a signal. It doesn't have anything to do with audio necessarily, but we can plot envelopes to see what they look like. So here is the envelope we've just created. Starts at zero, goes to one, goes to zero, uh, 0.1 seconds, 0.4 seconds for a total duration of 0.5, and zero means lineature segments. So we can uh, make this 1.4. And then we have a longer, it looks, looks similar, but see, we've got a 1.4 down here, 1.5 total duration. Um, uh, we can add another segment. We say 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 1, we've got two seconds. And then make sure this third segment is also linear. So now we're going 0 to 1, down to 0.5, right? So and it takes a tenth of a second to go up, tenth of a second to go down, and then to get back to zero, we need another full two seconds. <coughs> so now we've got a, you know, a three-segment envelope. Um, let's go back here for a second, just to show you what these curvature values do. So zero is linear. Um, make this longer. Go back to point four. So here's curvature values of zero. If we make these one, it curves the segments away from linearity uh, just a little bit. Um, if we go, say, up to five. So here's five. So linear, a little bit of a curvature, and positive values curve the segments so that they change slowly at first and then quickly. So slowly at first and then quickly. So if we were to do negative five and negative five. That gives us something like this. So curve values of zero, one, positive five, negative five. And of course you can mix and match. You don't have to do all positive or all negative values. So here's uh, positive five, curvature value, negative five. So you have lots of flexibility here. You can make as many segments as you want, whatever curvatures you want. You can see the envgen and env help files for a little bit more information on that. Um, so let's let's see putting env into play. So we'll just delete that for a moment. Uh, you know what? Let's just keep it. We'll keep it there for posterity. And we'll go into envgen here. We need uh, env.new. We'll say we'll do a nice little percussive segment. So quick attack, just uh, five milliseconds, very short and then maybe a uh, 0.3 seconds back down. Because the first segment is so short, the curvature really isn't going to have much of an audible impact. So I'm just going to go linear. And I want this to change quickly and then slowly. So I have like sort of a quick drop off and then level out towards the end. So I'm going to do a negative value. And just real quickly, we'll plot this. Plot this, not play this. Just the uh, end here, highlighting just that text, shift enter. So here's the envelope. We're going to, instead of a long, sustained uh, wine glass sound, we're going to do a little bing. And we can leave envgen like that with just providing the envelope and then doing this. But there's some things we're going to have to fix. So uh, let's just play this. Well, I've forgotten something very important, which is to actually apply the envelope. I'm, it's just sitting there, but it's not actually affecting SIG in some way. So here, right, it sort of worked, right? I'll turn these faders up a little bit and watch the level meter. Why is it so quiet? Right. Uh, we haven't specified otherwise, so play buff starts at the beginning. And if uh, you know, we can listen to the very beginning of this sound. It 
is And listen how it fades in very gradually. So what this envelope is doing is just taking the first 0 0.305 seconds and applying this envelope. And that's a very short amount of time. It's just only that. So we only get the very beginning of the sound, which is very quiet. So what if we want to start somewhere in the middle of the, of the wine glass sound? That seems like a better choice because uh, if we were to actually open up this uh, file here, um, and look at it, we are uh, enveloping this tiny bit right here. Right Here's the first point three whatever seconds. But it'd be nicer to just jump somewhere in the middle where there's a lots, of, lots of energy, lots of, lots of amplitude to work with. And we can do that with um, the start position argument for playbuff. So playbuff starts, it wants the number of channels, it wants the buffer that we're going to use, a playback rate, a trigger, we'll get to that. So here's start position. We can jump ahead to start pause um, by just typing it in exactly as it appears with a capital P. And start pause is a value in frames, not seconds or anything like that. Uh, and frames basically refer to samples. It's the number of samples. Now we know this is a 32 second file. And the sampling rate is, I um, believe it's 44,100. Uh, we can query a buffer, one glass rub, one dot num frames. And this is the number of frames in this. So any value between zero and 1,420,882 is acceptable. Because uh, frames are like indices. They start at zero, and this is how many there are. Um, so we could just we could just guess and say I don't know uh, seven hundred thousand right we'll just uh, totally approximate uh, approximate a central value here this is this is pretty sloppy I don't really recommend doing it this way um, but now here we go we've got more amplitude to work with because play buff starts in the middle and then it, this this tiny segment wherever that happens to fall is what's enveloped but look over here at the node tree right, we've got some lingering things here. We do have done action too. Right. So why aren't they why aren't they dying? Why aren't they disappearing? What's what's that? I'm not um yeah, i I'm not right, this the play buff doesn't reach its end until another fifteen or sixteen seconds or so. So yeah, there they go. They've they've disappeared, but it's taken a long time. So if we're envisioning our sound as being over when the envelope is over, then envgen should have the done action too. Just like playbuff, envgen is a ugen which has uh, a finite duration, right? It has an end. And so there is a done action argument for envgen. And uh, we can, uh, just like we did with start pause, we can say done action and skip ahead and say two. And so now if we do this, you can see in the node tree on the left, um, we can make as many as we want, and they, they die pretty quickly. And they, they leave the server, they, they expire. <coughs> um, right. Now, uh, I can imagine a situation where we don't want to have to keep mashing command enter in order to recreate these. So I, I would like to introduce now the idea of uh, triggers. Now, uh, in in Super Collider, there are lots of instances where you need to trigger a UGen to do something. And that trigger can say, it's, it's, it's basically like a, a starting gun. It says go, you know, or start over, or go to here. It's just a, a little a cue, a C-U-E, a cue. It says, it says do this thing. And um, uh, it's possible to uh, re-trigger an envelope, for example, to say begin again. Um, it's possible to tell Playbuff to go back to your starting position. Uh, and in Super Collider, any signal can be a trigger. Uh, a trigger, uh, what Super Collider interprets as a trigger is a non-positive to positive transition. So you can imagine, a, you know, if we have uh, some, some signal which is a trigger input, let's say we just have a sine wave, right? Um, 
if it starts at zero, then this moment here would be a trigger because it's a non-positive to positive transition. The next trigger would occur here and then here. So anytime a signal goes from zero or negative to positive, that's a trigger. So m lots of waveforms can act as triggers. Um, and there are some eugens which are really specifically designed to be triggers. Um, one of those is uh, impulse. So impulse, you know, we're actually let's actually just listen to impulse for a second. Let's do an audio rate impulse generator, frequency of five. Five impulses per second. And what that looks like, uh, an audio rate <coughs> impulse generator is simply a one of these. Right, so here's a value of one. Uh, these are individual samples, so we just get an audio rate impulse, right, and lots of zeros, and then in this particular case, five of those per second. So we have five non-positive to positive transitions per second. So we could uh, use what's that? Oh, you get a you get a um, you get a pitch. Um, five. Yep. Just like any periodic waveform generator. So let's go with five, I I guess. Um and Envgen has a couple of arguments. We know its first one is an instance of env. We know its last one is the done action, what to do with the synth that's been created on the server when the envelope finishes. And the second one is gate. This triggers the envelope and holds it open while greater than zero. If the env is fixed length, uh, which in our case it is, uh, the gate argument is used as a simple trigger. So we can, I mean, I'll space this out to uh, make it a little bit clearer. Something like this. So the second argument to Envgen is our, it's called gate, but we've defined a unit generator called trig, which is going to deliver five triggers per um, uh, per second. And I, I don't think this is going to work because I think there's a couple things we need to fix, but let's see what happens. Oh, it does work. But uh, if we, yeah, I think if we were to do a slower rate, and it doesn't work. Two doesn't work. Three doesn't work. Four works. Okay. Anyone know what's going on here? That's right. Uh, if if the impulses are too slow, the envelope is allowed to complete its 0 0.305 second duration. And when it completes its com full duration, it checks its done action. Done action is two, so it says you're out of here. So the whole thing dies, the impulse generator dies, there's no more impulses. So now we're dealing with the sound, uh, thinking in the abstract, the whole sound function is something which continues indefinitely. We want to make a bunch of impulses and we'll decide when it stops. So done action dude no longer really makes much sense. So now we can uh, you know, make, this <coughs> make this slower if we wanted. And I'm gonna set the start position a little bit later in the file and make this maybe three. And so if we do this, uh, listen to what happens. I think this, we've lost our done action too, but this, this will stop, I think, after about 10, 12 seconds or so. Okay, yeah, so what's happening now? Yes, we've gotten to the end of the sample. And the end of the sample um, looks like this. The end of the audio file is just, the end of it is a single sample, which is a very close to zero value. And 
play buff is just outputting this value at the audio rate now, which is so it, it's essentially silence. It's not not true digital silence, but it's very quiet. Uh, and EnvGen is continuing to trigger and and envelope those values, but they're already basically zero, so we get basically zero here. So we need to fix this, right? How do we how do we keep our play buff going? It's playing a sound file, and in order to play it, it's got to go from beginning to end or point A to point B. Uh, we can't just say don't move because then it'll just output a single value. Um, so we could loop it. That's one option. We know play buff has a loop argument. Um, that still does mean we'll have maybe a two or three second span where the amplitude kind of gets kind of quiet. So, you know, it's th that would work. We could just say loop one and then we'd get these impulses forever. Um, but I think I wanna I wanna get into uh, some some randomness a little bit. Uh, so what I'd like to do is modify this code so that every time we get a new envelope, we also cause buffer playback to jump to a random starting position. So this this requires diving into play buff a little bit. So we've got a trigger argument. So when play buff receives a trigger causes play buff to move its pointer to whatever the start position is. And a trigger occurs, as we know, when signal changes from a negative value to a positive. That's not exactly true. It should say from a non-positive value to a positive value. Um, so uh, we could say, um, uh, you know, let's, let's put in some more values here. The third one is the playback rate. We'll just leave that at 1. Uh, so there's no, no transposition. And now the trigger. We can just use this trig value. Right? We can use trig anywhere we like. We've defined it. It's a signal generator. So there's trig. And every time uh, an impulse is generated, the um, I, I believe playbuff will jump to frame with index 900,000. And if you listen really carefully, you'll hear that this is the exact same sound each time we get an impulse. If we were to change this to something like 300,000, that's a different one. So what's happening is we've got our, let's uh, do all of this. You know, we've got some sound file. You know, ooh, it's sound, right? It's great. Uh, and and playbuff normally just goes from beginning to end. And instead, we give it a, a start position. We say, here's your start position. And it gets a trigger. And wherever that pointer is, it says, I'm going here. And then it plays until it gets another trigger. And then it jumps back and jumps back and jumps back and jumps back. So we just end up replaying you know, this sort of tiny segment of time, which occurs uh, between impulses. Everybody sort of with me so far? Following? OK. Now, this is a class on. Um, multi-channel spatialization and <laughs> we've only been playing out of the front left speaker so uh, let's let's uh, add a add a pan um, ugen here and I'm gonna <coughs> say a pan which is going to be another another um, variable and you know, we have a lot of options here and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, uh, T rand dot kr. Oh, you know what? I meant to say one thing, which is when you have here's a. Let's, I think so. This if we just comment out this for a second before we get into. <coughs> look what happens if I accidentally do this. I have now an audio rate impulse generator. All right. <laughs> so, uh, right. Kr works just fine. Ar, we get the first one, and then nothing. Now what's happening here is audio rate unit generators uh, run at the audio rate. They have 44,100 samples per second. They're very high resolution. Um, control rate unit generators look more like this, if we're drawing the same waveform. Right? So they're just, it's uh, the default block size is 64 samples. So control rate unit generators output 
one sixty fourth the number of values as audio rate unit generators do. And if our end gen is at the control rate, it's only listening for triggers at the control rate. But if our impulse generator is running at the audio rate, then what's going to happen is impulses are going to sneak in between these control rates. You know, it, they're, they're not they're very likely not going to line up with the uh, with the uh, with the blocks. You know, the sixty four sample blocks. And so uh, end gen is just completely deaf to those. So if you're triggering an envelope, the triggering signal has to be running at the same rate. We could fix this by making the end gen audio rate as well. Right? So now they're running at the same rate, they can hear each other, uh, or they can both be KR, but you can't really mix and match. That's all I wanted to say on that. And KR is, is less expensive for your CPU. It's fewer samples, fewer values, less calculation. Okay, so now where was I? I was going to make a pan unit generator, and I was going to introduce T Rand. So there are three unit generators I want to bring your attention to, which are really, f really good for randomness, especially when dealing with triggers and you want to synchronize things. There's T Rand, T X Rand, which is a lot like T Rand, except T Rand has a linear distribution. Uh, T X Rand has an exponential distribution, so favoring lower values in the low to high range. And then we have T Choose, which is. Um, uh, it receives a trigger, and when it does, it selects a value from an array. So you can give it a set of discrete values or unit generators uh, to choose from. So uh, let's see, we can do, we'll say trig, and we will choose a value between negative 1.0 and 1.0, and uncomment our panning. And so now, think about what's going to happen here. We're getting three triggers a second, and these triggers are uh, being used in several different places. One, to, to pick up random left-right pan position, to re-trigger the envelope, and cause play buff to jump to its start position. And so because uh, pan is being used in pan two, uh, each, each uh, 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 sound will be somewhere in the stereo field, I think. Working. Trigger's supposed to be the last. Trigger's supposed to be the last thing in T Rand. So oh, the I messed up the uh, order. Yeah. Uh, how about that? <laughs> okay. So whenever you do stuff like that, there's it's a completely random chance that it might be auditorily explosive. But we got away with murder there. So. Yeah, I believe that's working. We've got this sort of random bouncing, bouncing sound. Um, I yeah, I was still in T choose mode, <laughs> which uh, for which the um, uh, trig is um, the first, the first one. So we can make this a little bit more uh, interesting. And um, so instead of a fixed start position, it's this is getting kind of static because we get the exact same sound each time, even though it's moving around. It doesn't have this sort of. Uh, it seems kind of lifeless because it's just like re-triggering the same, the same exact sequence of, of uh, audio samples. So, we will make another variable called start pause. We can again we can name these whatever we want. I just whatever you call your variables, the fact that these are you know almost exactly the same. You know I mean you can call this s pause, call this start, whatever you like, right? Whatever you like. Um, we will use T rand, and we're going to say 0 to wgr1.num frames minus 1. Well, see, OK, so maybe maybe we should uh, use a different value here, because uh, w what I want to do is, is plug this in here. Um, but you know, if we, if we happen to choose this value, which is um, this Sample right here, we really have nowhere to go, right? So m maybe something better would be the number of frames uh, times 0.8 or something. So just within the full range of samples we can choose, don't take the last 20 percent. You know, you can do all sorts of math here. You know, you can uh, to to shift the 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 low and high range. You don't have to start at zero. You can you can, you know anyway. So this this is sort of guarantees we won't get a sample at the end which 
Uh, and I, I don't think the default behavior is to loop. So if we were to pick a, a sample all the way at the end, I think we would just have the same problem that where we, uh, where we ended up at the end of play buff and it was just re-triggering basically silent. So um, you know, that's, that's something to keep in mind. So this should now, uh, I have a semicolon that I need to put here. But yeah, yeah, I, um, no, it's working now. I, there was, I, I had forgotten a semicolon here. Yeah, if we make the impulses too high, we start to get this clicky, clickiness. And what's happening there is the impulses are starting to come so fast um, you know, it, this this is 10 hertz, so it's uh, uh, point, point 0.1 period. And our envelope is longer than that. So what happens is our envelope sort of starts, and then as it's, you know, dipping down to point 0.3, it gets re-triggered, and that causes it to move from wherever it is, somewhere between 0 and 1, back up to its peak value. And so instead of a, a nice sequence of uh, disconnected envelopes, like this. Right, this is this is nice. This avoids clicks because here we have our our signal, our signal, and we jump to a new start position right here, right here, right, right here. And um, but if the impulses come too quickly, what we get is something like this. Right. And so now it's right right here, right here. This is where we're picking a new start position in the play buff and jumping to it. And so th that is very likely to cause uh, discontinuity. Like if we happen to be right here, and then our new start position is right here, and so we have a, a positive value and a negative value, what the waveform ends up looking like is, is this, right? this, this jagged you know, knife cut through the waveform. And that sounds bad. If we were to play that, it sounds like this. You can hear it, it. It sounds like there's just a big, ugly, big, ugly thing in it. And we, we don't really like that. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line here is that if we're going to do this all with unit generators, this is not, you know, there, there's only so much we can do to avoid this. What we can do is, um, you know, make this a value that somehow uh, affects the, um, the, Duration, right? If we let's just sort of normalize this so it's 0.1 to 0.9, right? So it's a one second thing, and then we can say trig hertz equals 10. Uh, yeah, just like that. We'll make a new variable, say 10 trig hertz goes here, and then uh, we just need to multiply or divide this by trig hertz, I think. And then what happens is this duration, let's just make sure this works. I, I think you can do division with an array. This is just one solution that sort of comes to mind. Yeah, so that gives us the array 0 0.01, 0 0.09, and that has a total duration of the, the period of, of this uh, impulse generator. So I think that's one way to solve the solution, uh, solve, solve the problem. So if we make this 20, the envelope just gets shorter to compensate for the faster triggers. If, that's, if that solution is sort of up your alley, you know. But this means when we have slow triggers, we always have long envelopes and maybe we don't want that, maybe, you know, we we want to be able to specify our, we want something like super, super, super short. So that's that's the downside of this solution is that you sort <coughs> of lock, lock together your envelope duration and the rate at which envelope, the envelope is re-triggered. Um, right. So uh, let's see, what, what else can we do? Um, We've got this. We've got this trigger here. So, 
how about we switch over to um, uh, wh where would TX brand make a lot of sense? Yeah, well we have this rate. It's always it's always one, right? We we it's so easy to forget about pitch. Let's make these faster. So again, the third argument of play buff is a is a rate argument. So two is an octave up, 0.5 is an octave down. Well, that's pretty cool. But um, it's fun to use triggers and randomness to, to move this around. Uh, you know, w something we, we did last time was, you know, a noise generator. We'll give it an exponential range between 0.2 and 1. If we make it slower, we can actually hear the linear um, movement of, of LF, or the, the sort of segmented behavior of LF noise 1, like this. So it's a linear interpolating, in, interpolating noise generator picking a new value every two seconds, and it's going to range exponentially somewhere between 0.2, which is, um, you know, the, the frequency drops by a factor of five, or the original rate. And if we speed this up, then it, we, we really lose track of the linear behavior, and it's just sort of... Yeah, maybe a sine wave would be fun. So here, here we can, th the sine wave is actually moving quite a bit faster than the rate of the impulse generation. So every time we get an envelope, we get a few wiggles of that sine wave in there so we can really hear the wee 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 wee. Let's go back to our triggered randomness. Um, so we'll do T X rand. Again, we want to match the rate of our impulse generator so they can, they're running at the same rate, both at the control rate. And we'll say 0.2 to one again using trig. So instead of a continuously moving signal now, we're, we've just got a process that responds to triggers and uh, generates a new value and stays at that value. Um, you can think of it as, as like a non-interpolating noise generator, but it's completely slaved to trig. Right. Everybody with me so far? Yes, one, one, cool. Uh, impulse has a, uh, I think of impulse as one unit generator of a pair of unit generators, which are, which are primarily used for generating trigger signals. So impulse is the periodic version, and the aperiodic version is dust. Dust is almost identical to impulse, is that, I I uh, but that instead of generating a uh, impulses at a frequency, it generates uh, a density of impulses. So you give it a value which you can think of as frequency, but it's really just you'll get approximately that many per second and they will be scattered around. So now we get this instead. All right. And you can you can hear we're getting a few ugly clicks in there. And uh, this is because we we have less control over when these triggers occur with dust. So we might get two that are basically just back to back. In which case we get our um, this this problem with making a you know a instantaneous jump in our waveform, so we get a click. So maybe dust doesn't make a whole lot of sense here, but um, it is a good unit generator to be aware of because um, you know impulse is always very regular, and, and it's nice to have irregular impulses sometimes as well. <coughs> uh, I'm going to say make a, make another variable called rate and and we'll do t choose now uh, we put our trigger in here we want to pick a new playback rate each time we get a trigger and we give it an array of values now we are thinking in terms of playback 
speed ratios, right? One, two, point five. And no musician that walks the earth thinks about pitch in terms of ratios. It's possible to explain pitch in terms of ratios, but we think in terms of, uh, you know, like uh, at least letter letter names, you know, A, B, C, D, E, sharps, flats, um, at least, you know, MIDI note numbers or something. So uh, it's if we want to, like, you know, pick from the notes in a scale, this is not the right domain to think of these. So let's let's put, um, uh, I think we can just put, uh, you know, scale degrees in here. Like, let's say, uh, if we're thinking uh, 0 through 11 as being the chromatic scale, you know, 0 is, you know, uh, if we, we'll just treat the, whatever pitch is in the original file, right, whatever is, you know, we can, oh, I, <laughs> I gotta get rid of that click, there we go. I don't know why those clicks are in there, I think Audacity is kind of struggling. Um, so uh, let's see where was I? So we'll we'll just say like uh, let's do. Let's just you know what we're just gonna make the whole chromatic scale first. Uh, we can there's a short there's a great shortcut for making arrays. Uh, if we just do zero dot dot eleven in parentheses, it gives us the array of integers, zero to eleven. It's a handy trick. Um, but we can't just plug these values straight into. We can. It's just zero is gonna do nothing. One is the original, two is an octave up, three is an octave and a fifth, and uh, you know, 11 is like three and a half octaves up. It's just not what we want. We can, we can do it and see what, see what happens. I mean, it's gonna sound a little weird. Oh, and let's go back to impulse so we don't get those ugly clicks. So what we actually have here is like a, a harmonic series. We have, uh, you know, one, two, three, four. Those are basically harmonics. But we don't want that. Uh, we can do. Uh, uh, we can. I think we can either do this here. Uh, dot MIDI ratio. Is that gonna work? Yeah. MIDI ratio. Let's make some room for ourselves here. Zero dot MIDI ratio gives one. It takes a transposition value in semitones and turns it into a frequency ratio. So if we transpose a pitch by zero semitones, in other words, don't move it anywhere, the ratio of the old pitch to the new pitch is one. If we say 12, that MIDI ratio, that gives us, we'll call that two. Sound fair? Uh, because if we transpose up by, by positive 12 semitones, that gives us um, an octave. And so we get the ratio, which gives us an octave. If we do minus 12, that gives us 0.5. If we go 1, I mean, how many, what's the ratio of a pair of equal tempered semitones, right? Adjacent semitones. Uh, well, I don't know it in my head, but MIDI ratio does. It's 1.059, blah, 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 blah. So if we can apply MIDI ratio to an array, what we get is an array of ratios for the chromatic scale. So now we can plug this in and we'll get. if we're limiting ourselves to one octave on the keyboard and just playing random notes in there. Um, we can do, uh, if we do 0, comma 2, dot, dot, 12, this is a, a shorthand for filling an array with numbers, but uh, specifying an initial increment. Oops. I meant to do this. So <coughs> 0, 2, and then it fills in the rest up to 12. So now we have the whole tone scale. tweaking my numbers a little bit. If we have a really negative value here, it's, uh, we have this extreme curvature. And why don't we do a nice major scale, right? Who can resist a major scale? There's actually a class called scale. And if you do scale.directory, this gives you a list of all the scales in the scale directory. So there is major in here. So we can say scale dot major dot degrees. This returns the array uh, of scale degrees that we need for the major scale. And 
dot midi ratio. I'm, I totally admit this sounds extremely computery to me. Like this is this is not very <laughs> this is not something a human would do. It just screams computer generated randomness, which is fine if that's what you're into. Uh, you know, it, it sometimes takes a little bit more. I mean, what if what if we want to actually play a scale, right? We want to actually go like up the scale, maybe up and down the scale. Uh, this is something I, I haven't really deeply prepared, but I do know how you do it. I I wouldn't. This, uh, to, to actually sequence a specific ordering of events, I would use patterns for that, which is uh, the topic we'll get into next week. But to show you how it would be done here, we'll just comment this out. Uh, and we would make, I think it's, it's a UGen called D-seq, which is a uh, demand rate sequential generator. Uh, and we provide the values that we want as an array. So remember, this doesn't look like an array, but it, it is an array. And then the number of repeats, we'll say, do it forever. We can just say INF, it's a special value, which represents infinity. And then we need to enclose this in a demand unit generator, which receives a trigger. So these triggers really are everywhere. They're all, all throughout SuperCollider, very handy stuff. Uh, reset, I think this is the, the uh, I forget what reset does. It resets the list of UGENs when triggered. And then finally, we provide a demand rate unit generator. So I think the, the DSeq actually ends up going here. So I think this should play a scale. Yeah, we're missing our, our last note because uh, scale.measure.degrees isn't redundant. It doesn't give us the top value. It just goes do, 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 do. So we can like concatenate it with 12 if we want if we want that, that upper end. So now we've got the full scale. We've added 12 to the end. And we can you know do stuff like dot midi ratio dot reverse. I'm getting really distracted with the, the pitch aspect of this and I, I do want to focus more on uh, spatialization. So we'll come back to this for just a moment. And uh, let's just go back to T X brand dot K R. Something like that. Watch what happens if we, uh, let's say we were just making our rate argument, our rate variable here, and we said, okay, we'll make a rate. There we go. Fails, right? It fails. It says uh, trig, uh, T X brand trig has bad input, nil. And so these have to go in the right order. The problem here is that we are using trig before we are defining trig. We declare trig. It's initially got no value. It's a value of nil, and so we can't use it here. So just keep in mind that this code is actually compiled and executed in order, just like just like regular code. So just uh, just to anticipate that. Um, so uh, let's see. So instead of t rand, you know, we can uh, yeah, we we don't have to use randomness. We can use uh, uh, yeah t. We did this already. We did T choose, right? Choosing either hard left or hard right. So again, all, all sorts of unit generators can go here. I think the one the one last thing I wanna I wanna show is so we've got uh, you know, a nice low frequency triangle wave with an initial phase of three, I think. Let's triangle yeah, phase for LF tri is supposed to range from zero to four. Um, looks like this so here's a, a full cycle so phase of zero starts here one two three four so if we give it an initial phase of three then we start hard left right and move from left to right right to left right, move to the right left to the right make it a little bit slower 
a little bit faster. And uh, I wanted to show that there, there are lots of um, mathematical operations that you know normally you can do with um, uh, with numbers, right? You can say three to the power of one half, right? And that works just fine. You can also do things like dot pow, dot square, dot square root with unit generators. So let's say trig hertz isn't nine. Uh, trig hertz is uh, a low frequency triangle wave. Like this, which has a default range of minus one to one. So we can say, let's instead do a range. No, uh, yeah, let's do a range from um, Uh, 0 0.1 to 9. Okay, so we've got this range. The triangle wave going from point 0.1 to 9, and it's controlling our, our impulses. So we can do something like uh, dot pow. Uh, This is going to be the most elegant thing. But let's do, um, oh, I'm trying to remember what I did in my notes. Uh, let me back up a second. What is it I want to do? Yeah, I want to go, I want to go left to right, which we've got turning up. Okay, I know what I want to do. So here's here's our, our pan control, right? And this is by default minus one to positive one. Uh, and it's it's linear, right? It's just a, it's a triangle wave. And so I'm gonna say uh, to the power of uh, one half. It doesn't sound too different initially, but if I say to the power of one over twenty. So normally the triangle wave looks like this. Right? And let's look at it. Let's uh, imagine a transfer function here. So um, the triangle wave is spitting out values. That's the best diagonal line I can do uh, from minus one to positive one. And if we raise these values to the power of one half, what happens is the values do something like this. because small values to the power of 1 half uh, between 0 and 1 get a little bit closer to 1. If we raise them to the power of 1 over 20, then they start to look like this. Very sloppy. Right. So what happens is here we're sort of pushing the, you know, we're, we're forcing these pan values to favor being closer to minus 1 and positive 1. And, and similarly, we could raise them to, a, you know, like the power of 2 or 4 or 8, and we'd we'd be doing the opposite thing. And we'd be having them sort of, within that range, mostly get stuck to the center. Let's go ahead and, and do that just for fun. If we do power of, to the power of nine, eh, power of five. Mostly in the middle. And then they very occasionally pop over to the side. Just there are lots of methods like this: pow, squared, square root, trigonometric functions, things like that. Um, okay, so we'll we'll stop it there, and um, uh, I'll cook up another homework assignment uh, this evening and put this online. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email.